Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship in God's house this morning. I've heard a three-word term before, a phrase. Maybe you've heard it too. Nothing lasts forever. That may be true with many things in this world, but as Jesus will tell us, and as we will sing today, there is something that lasts forever. By God's grace, the church will last forever. It will never <coughs> perish. That's God's promise. We'll study and learn more about that today. God bless our worship this morning as we remember how God has made us part of his church. Baptismal waters cover me. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Holy Amen. and merciful Amen. Father, I Amen. confess Amen. that I am by nature Amen. sinful, and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner.
Father has been merciful to us and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. and everlasting God, give us an increase of faith, hope, and love, and that we may obtain what you promise, make us love what you command. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated for the first reading. Our first reading from Scripture this morning comes from Joshua chapter 4, beginning with verse 1. The church shall never perish. The Lord God held back the waters of the Jordan as the people crossed through into the promised land. When the whole nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord told Joshua, Take twelve men from the people, one man from each tribe, and give them the following orders. Pick up twelve stones from here in the middle of the Jordan, from the place where the feet of the priests are standing securely. Carry them over with you and put them at the place where you will stay tonight. So Joshua called the twelve men whom he had selected from the people of Israel, a man from each tribe. Joshua said to them, Go to the middle of the Jordan in front of the ark of the Lord your God. 
There each man is to lift up one stone on his shoulder. The number will correspond to the number of the tribes descended from the sons of Israel, so that this may be a sign among you when your children ask in the future, What do these stones mean for you? Then you shall respond to them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off in front of the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When the Ark passed through the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. These stones will serve as a permanent memorial for the people of Israel. So the people of Israel did just as Joshua had ordered. They picked up 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan, corresponding to the number of the tribes descended from the sons of Israel, as the Lord had instructed Joshua. They carried the stones over with them to their lodging place and deposited them there. Joshua also set up 12 stones in the middle of the Jordan at the spot where the feet of the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant had stood. They are there to this day. This is the word of the Lord. You are part of God's church by his grace. Therefore, happy are the people the Lord has chosen to be his own. We sing Psalm 34. of the Jordan in the Old Testament, the book of Revelation reminds us that God also has held back the winds of destruction before the coming of the last and great day of judgment. God does that to preserve his church until his coming. From Revelation chapter 7, beginning with verse 1. After this, I saw four angels who stood at the four corners of the earth, they were holding back the four winds of the earth so that the wind could not blow on the earth, the sea, or any tree. And I saw another angel coming up from the east who had the seal of the living God. He called out with a loud voice to the four angels who were given power to harm the earth and the sea. He said, do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees until we have placed a seal on the foreheads of God's servants. And I heard the number of those sealed, 
144,000 sealed from all the tribes of the people of Israel. From the tribe of Judah, 12,000 who were sealed. From the tribe of Reuben, 12,000. From the tribe of Gad, 12,000. From the tribe of Asher, 12,000. From the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000. From the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000. From the tribe of Simeon, 12,000. From the tribe of Levi, 12,000. From the tribe of Issachar, 12,000. From the tribe of Zebulun, 12,000. From the tribe of Joseph, 12,000. From the tribe of Benjamin, 12,000 who were sealed. This is the word of the Lord. Alleluia! Jesus Christ has destroyed death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Alleluia! We invite you to please stand. The Gospel according to Matthew chapter 16. According to Matthew chapter 16, the church remains on the rock of our Redeemer, Jesus Christ. This will also serve as our sermon text for this morning. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? They said, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, But you, who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not overpower it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he commanded the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Christ. This is the gospel of the Lord. I invite you to confess the Christian faith with the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated as we sing the first four stanzas of the church's one foundation.
Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. As we meditate upon God's word this morning, we turn to the words of our gospel reading. Dear brothers and sisters in our Lord Jesus Christ, a couple of weeks ago I went home to South Dakota and after the long drive I also made another short drive to a place called Grover, South Dakota. In Grover, South Dakota, I find a place where I was baptized many, many years ago. But I tell you that story because there is no church there anymore. Where there was once a church that had stood for over a hundred years is now a green, flat plain. There's no church at all. It was a country church that boasted several hundred members many decades ago. Now that church, that country church, is no more. I want to take a poll here this morning. I want to find out from you if you belong to a church at one time that no longer exists to this day. Raise your hand. There's quite a few. Some of you were members of Grace on the west side. Divine Savior on the northeast side. Some of you were part of the ELS church. Maybe the buildings still stand, but those churches are no longer there. They're gone. But we know that the church is not just a building. Jesus reminds us today once again that the church shall never perish. How can we be sure of that? We see with our own eyes church perish, churches perishing all around, it appears. One thing that we remember, we remember that the church will always endure because the church confesses Christ and because the church has the keys which were given to it by Christ. Think about the time when Jesus spoke these words in Matthew chapter 16. Jesus was in his last, day, last year before he would actually die upon the cross. During that last year, he would often take his disciples alone and speak to them. And that's what he did here as well. He asked them a question one day. Who do people say that the Son of Man is? It's kind of an interesting response that they came up with when those disciples had listened to the different, differing opinions that people had of Jesus. Some of them said, well, he's John the Baptist, or he's Jeremiah, or one of the other prophets, Elijah. Think about that. People had opinions of Jesus. And we could even say that they had high opinions of Jesus to say that he was a prophet. Wow. But even though they had these high opinions of Jesus, they weren't high enough. To their eyes, Jesus looked like a diamond in the rough. He could do a lot of good things, speak a lot of good words, but this wasn't the Savior, the Messiah that they had anticipated so they didn't see Jesus as more than just a prophet. They didn't see him as the prophet. Has anything changed today? Are there still people today who think of Jesus as just a nice guy, a wise man, a prophet? There's even some false religions out there who see Jesus as that. But there's even Christians who can mistake Jesus they mistake his identity by saying, well, he's just a powerful prophet. He did a lot of good miracles. He was quite a miracle worker. And I expect him to do some miracles in my life, too. Then I'll believe in him more and more if he would just do some miracles in my life. Some people see Jesus as a moral advisor. Jesus comes along and says, do this, do this, do this. Don't do this, do this, do this. Hmm? as if to tell us what we are to do and not to do, and when we do and don't do those things that Jesus says, then somehow we are favored by God, by all the good things that we do. He's that moral advisor. Some people see Jesus as a social warrior, someone who's going to come and help me, either in his person or by the government, and give me all kinds of goodies, so that I will be satisfied with the riches of this life. Jesus will take away all my troubles in this life. Jesus is my social warrior. And all the while, they mistake 
the true Jesus for who he really is. They don't know who he is. Jesus hasn't come just to be a moral advisor. He has come to point at each one of us and remind us we have all fallen short of the glory of God. Jesus has come to remind us that he is our Savior who has taken away those sins so that each day we live, we live in that forgiveness that Christ has won for us. Jesus is far more than a moral advisor. Jesus is far more than a social warrior. Jesus didn't come to relieve me of all my pain and sickness and disease and injustice in this life. Jesus said, there's going to be many crosses you as Christians will have to bear in this life. You are not in that kingdom of glory. You are in a kingdom that is called the church militant where there are going to be many battles, many struggles, many doubts, many fears that you will have to overcome, but you do not overcome them alone. Christ is with you. Christ, your Savior, is there to help you. Christ comes to you through his word to relieve you, to give you peace that this world cannot give. Jesus did not come to relieve you of all your physical injustices in this world. He is the Savior who has justified you from all your sins so that when your last day comes, you will be able to stand before the gates of heaven and enter those gates by his grace, by his grace alone. Dear friends, remember what Peter said here. Peter said to Jesus, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's who Jesus is. Remember that he is God's chosen, the deliverer from all sin, the one who grants forgiveness of all those sins, the one who is your savior from sin, the one who promises you eternal life with him in heaven, the one who gives you strength for each passing day until he finally delivers you from this veil of tears and brings you safely home to heaven. That's God's gift to you. Confess him just as Peter did. C.S. Lewis, who was once a very famous writer, he said this. He said, either Jesus is a madman who deserved to be killed, or he is God and Lord who deserves to be bowed down to and worshipped. But anything in between that, he has not given us that option of just saying he was a nice guy or a powerful miracle worker. He has not given us that option. He is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And may we continue to confess as Peter did so long ago. That is the source of the strength of the church which has been revealed to you by God's word. Flesh and blood did not reveal that to you. God, through his word, revealed that to you, just as Jesus said, had been revealed to Peter. It's been revealed to you by God's grace through the word. But how is the church continued to, to be sustained through these times, in these times of vitriol, these times of acrimony that we see all around us today, how will the church be sustained at a time like this? Jesus gives a beautiful gift to his church called the keys. Remember how Jesus turns to Peter and says to Peter, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. Now, many of you probably already know this is what the Roman Catholic Church points to and says, look at Peter was the first pope, and throughout the ages, this is what the church stands on, the pope and his word. But that's not what the word of God says. Jesus has a play on words. There's two different Greek words here. There's the word Peter, which means rock-like, and then there's the word rock. But what is the rock upon which the church stands? Is it Peter? Peter was a sinful man. That's shown in scripture. The church doesn't stand on a sinful man. On a sinful man, Peter would be a dying man. There are other writings in Scripture that tell us that eventually Peter died a martyr's death. Is this upon which the church stands? 
The church stands not on a man, but on a confession. That confession that Peter made, that confession that God worked in the heart of Peter, that God has worked in your hearts too. What is that confession? That confession is this. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. The church stands because it rests in that confession. Remember what also it says here. It does not say that Peter is the foundation of the church. Jesus goes on to say, I will build my church. Did you catch that? I, Jesus says, will build my church. It's all because of him and his grace. And because he is the one who builds his church and promises to be with his church until the last day, he also gives us this comfort. He tells us the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The gates of hell, they stand wide open, ready to take in as many people as they possibly can. We have a formidable foe in the devil. He is our old, evil, wily foe who will continue to cause doubt and despair in the minds of people to take their eyes off of Jesus and confession of him. Dear friends, Jesus says the gates of hell will not prevail against his church. Isn't this a great comfort to know in spite of all that we see happening? Even when churches may close, Jesus says that the church will continue to endure until the last day. Now, he does not promise that in this place, until Jesus comes again, that this church will exist. He says the church, namely God's people, and the word and the sacrament, that will endure until Jesus comes again. And in that we rest and find peace. Dear friends, Jesus has given to you what he gave to Peter. Jesus gave a high honor to Peter. But that same high honor has been given to each and every Christian. That's the keys. <coughs> what are the keys? You know what the keys are. They unlock and lock your doors, right? I must admit this past week, I actually closed and locked the door to my house, and I was locked out. No way I was getting back in. Has that ever happened to you? God has given you spiritual keys, a locking and unlocking key. You, by God's grace, are able to unlock the doors to the God's kingdom of grace, which leads to that kingdom of glory. You are also able to lock to use that locking key too when necessary, huh? Martin Luther put it so well in the catechism. He says, the use of the keys is that special power and right which Christ gave to his church on earth to forgive the sins of the penitent sinner, but to not forgive the sins of the impenitent sinner as long as they do not repent. This is the life of the church. Don't just think that it's the pastor on Sunday morning who extends forgiveness to sinners. You do that. You do that, grandmothers and grandfathers, as you share the words of forgiveness with a child or a grandchild. You do that, dear parents, as you meditate upon God's word in your family homes. The use of the keys is the life of the church extending that forgiveness of Jesus when it is necessary, when we are to do that. Also, to withhold that forgiveness in love when someone continues to live in their sin and not realize that they are living in impenitence. I once had a person come up to me and say, Preacher, you cannot forgive sins. Only Jesus can. How can you stand up there on a Sunday morning and say, I forgive you all your sins. And I told him, well, look at what God's word says. God has graciously given these keys to his church 
I am a minister of the Lord, extending that gracious gift of forgiveness to his people. And did you notice in our confession and absolution this morning, what were the words preceding those words that I spoke? I forgive you all your sins. We talked about Jesus and his forgiveness. And then we said, I am a servant of the Lord. I am a servant of God. And by his authority, I forgive you all your sins. I can't forgive somebody, but Jesus has. And through me and through you, he continues to extend his forgiveness. This is the life of the church. You are part of that life of the church. Dear friends, we see churches closing, don't we? From the windows of that church in Grover, South Dakota, you could look out at a cemetery. That's why my family members and I went to that site where that church was, because I have grandparents buried there, great-grandparents buried there, great-great-grandparents buried there. But they're still part of the church the church that I look forward to being a part of. I'm part of the church militant here. I will be with them in heaven in the church triumphant, and so will you, all by the grace of God. And therefore, we can say, the church shall never, ever perish. Praise be to God. Amen. Now the peace of God which surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We join to sing, Create in Me. Jesus Christ, who has paid the price of our sins and reconciled us to God, make us fully committed to you and your gospel, so that we feel an urgent need to share you with others. Help us to seek and save the lost among our families, neighbors, and friends, and bless the word we speak, using it to work faith in their hearts. Cause the word of salvation that is sown and rooted in the hearts of the redeemed sinners to bring forth abundantly the fruit of good works to your glory. Defeat every godless force which would lay stumbling blocks in the way of the gospel. Give our pastors, teachers, and missionaries a deep sense of dedication to their calling that selfish pride and self-glory may have no part in their ministries. Fill each of us with enthusiasm for their work. May we ever support them with our prayers and willingly provide for their physical needs. Protect our missionaries wherever they labor, keeping them and their families from all harm and danger. According to your gracious will, give them good health and spare them the ravages of sickness and disease. Bear them up when they have no strength and encourage them when, they, when the way is difficult. Hinder every evil power which would threaten to drive our missionaries from foreign lands. Open up those countries to the gospel which before have been close to it. Grant that your word, wherever it is preached, will not return to you empty, but will accomplish your purpose of bringing sinners to repentance. O crucified and risen Christ, give grace to your church day by day, 
that it may accomplish that task to which you have called it, to witness your name in all the world and to preach the gospel to every creature. Today we also pray for Jeff Colton, who is in hospice care, and Patty Jo Hendrickson, who has been diagnosed with aggressive terminal cancer. We pray, O oh Lord, that these people would rest all their confidence, not in themselves, but in you. Lead them to see your grace and mercy and to understand that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And finally, according to your grace, deliver them from this world of sickness and trouble and death to yourself in heaven, where the joy and the glory knows no end in the church above. We give you thanks and praise for the continuing recovery of Mike Lyons from his foot surgeries. We pray that you would continue to watch over him and bless him. Thank you for giving him strength to be with us this morning in church. We pray for Abby Stout, diagnosed with COVID, who is the daughter, the granddaughter of Joe and Brenda Stout. We pray that you would bless her, continue to watch over her and care for her. Thank you for not allowing her to see many symptoms from COVID. Give her peace and patience during her time of quarantine. Bless all those who are sick at this time and give them a speedy recovery according to your will. Lord, hear us as we also bring to you our private petitions. We too must flee for refuge to your name, asking pardon for our many sins. Pardon especially our neglect of your great commission, for we all too often fail to glorify your saving name to others. Forgive us and save us, precious Redeemer of mankind. Amen. And in Jesus' name we also join to pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And all with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is very right that so to you. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who promised that wherever two or three come together in his name, there he is with them to shepherd his flock till he comes again in glory. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song.
Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then Jesus took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Jesus' body and blood for all our visitors. We ask that you would please speak with the pastor before communing this morning. God bless our celebration of his sacrament. Take and eat. This is the true body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, given over to death for all of your sins. Take and drink. This is the true blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, shed for you for the forgiveness of all your sins. Now this true body and true blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and preserve you in the one true faith unto life everlasting. Your sins are forgiven in Jesus our Savior. We part in his peace. Amen. Take and eat. This is the true body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ.
you to please stand as we join in the song of Simeon.
give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. And in his mercy and his We give thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us with this holy supper. We pray that through it you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We invite you to remain standing for the final hymn, the hymn verse of the Church's One Foundation. for joining us for worship this morning. What a blessing to have you with us and a special welcome to our guests as well. We hope that you can come back and join us in the future too. What a blessing. Uh, just a few announcements about today. Uh, I think we're getting used to this new word in our context, hybrid. Huh? There's a hybrid Bible study after our fellowship hour this morning. That means it's in person and online. And uh, so please come and join us for that. There will be an in-person team Bible study right here in the sanctuary too so all right uh then there's bible study oh. sorry that's okay bible <laughs> study coming up on monday uh catechism begins this week senior catechism move these times back 15 minutes i was just told by a parent this morning that uh, they can't make it for 3 30 but maybe 3 45 so 3 45 senior catechism 5 15 junior catechism hope that isn't too confusing but that only applies to a few people here anyway Continue our Wednesday evening Bible study. That's a hybrid as well. That should say hybrid. And then uh, next week, by God's grace, we'll start Sunday school too, which will be hybrid as well. Uh, it will be in person for those kids that are here. And then uh, also there'll be some of our kids online watching the videos and receiving materials from our Sunday school teachers too. So, all right, thank you. <laughs> There's the people we just prayed for. Uh, let's see, Abby has a birthday, huh? She's going to be turning 14. So congratulations, Abby. We'll sing happy birthday to Abby Lorenz. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Abby. Happy birthday to you. birthday, Abby. What a blessing. All right. Uh, there's the budget for so far. I think we're up about 5% on there. Praise be to the Lord for that, from last week anyway. Uh, Sunday school, we mentioned Sunday school and catechism beginning very soon this week and next Sunday. Uh, forwarding Christ magazine and meditations. There's still copies in the back as well. Please pick those up for your devotional life for the feeding of your faith. Uh, then there's the Bible studies that are coming up too. We just mentioned those. Rummage sale, this is still a go. Uh, we're, we're working with the Johnson County Health 
department. They've given us their blessing. So we're, we're working on that. Other people have been calling in and saying, hey, can we leave our stuff here? And I think we can. Uh, I think there's still room in the garage. Yeah, as long as it don't get in the way of the lawnmower, I'm as, good. As long as it doesn't get in the way of the lawnmower. Yeah, it, it may not be worthy of sale if it meets the lawnmower, right? Uh, it gets all chopped up. And, uh, we talked about the new hymnal last time. We'll say more about that in the weeks to come. And then upcoming events. This came up at the ladies' aid meeting, so I thought I'd just kind of share some of these. We're hoping to have a fall cleaning of the interior of the church on October 3rd. That's a Saturday morning. Um, and you can come at whatever time is convenient for you. I think we'll probably set the time for 9 o'clock, but if you want to come earlier, you can. Or if you need to come later, you, you can too. But we'd appreciate many hands to make light work of that. The Lutheran Women's Missionary Society virtual rally will be at Mansfield, Ohio. Uh, you can watch it from the comfort of your own home. There will be a missionary giving a presentation on that day too. Uh, well, here we go way ahead, huh? We're not just skipping over Advent. Advent services will be happening too, but again, I'm just relaying what the ladies' aid came up with, right? Christmas decorating. Uh, oh boy, I did, oh yeah, there's the date, November 28th and undecorating. Uh, January 10th. So if you want to mark these dates in your calendar and think about coming and joining us for that fellowship and, and doing those things, that would be great. Finally, here's, oh, here's a picture and then we got questions coming up too. Uh, I know it's hard to see on this wall. That's one of the things we're hoping to get eventually is a screen so you can see things much better. But this is just to give you an idea of a hybrid meeting. This is the ladies group that met this past Tuesday. Several ladies that were there in person and then other ladies that were online. The bottom one is the TV that now sits in our fellowship hall. So this is how the modern church is doing things right now anyway. Huh? And praise be to God, we're so thankful for our ladies who do so much for our church. We're so grateful for their work. They're busy grandmas and moms, and yet they still come together to help out planning the mission of the church, and uh, they, they, they do so much for us, and we thank God for them. All right, now, uh, yes, Leah? Um, I was just wondering if anyone has a ladder that I could borrow for a few days this week. Um, I just need to be able to reach my ceiling in my apartment, it, or does the church have one, or that I can we, just borrow? We do have one, yes. Is, yeah. it, is it a slanty one, or is it a tripod? Or well, I mean, a, 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 what do you call it? A step one. Whatever, step one, yeah. Yeah, I think like this. Okay, but oh. I can reach the ceiling but, with it? Uh, <laughs> Regular, you know. Oh, okay, all right. Well, think, okay, then I will, I will. Maybe if you want to speak to Mr. Twos, uh, okay. you're welcome to do okay, that. He, he could probably line you up and help you out there. Right. So, thank you. Thank you, thank Leah. You. Any other questions or comments? All right. I think that's it for today. And please stick around for fellowship if you feel comfortable doing so. And God be with you till we meet again.